Thank you. Um, so this is a talk which follows on quite nicely from from the previous one. Was, uh, it's about glo the global perspective on sharing lessons learned and mitigating environmental risks of future supercritical development strategies. And so I'm incorporating the uh, collaboration work from uh, all these partners, the uh, IPGT, the Geothermal Next Generation, the New Zealand Research Work, and, uh, and of course, AEA Geothermal. Um, the, uh, we'll get the presentation working. Here we go. So the outline of this work is uh, I'm looking at the goals and challenges of the IEA geothermal uh, work, which uh, I've been involved in for its entire lifetime, 25 years now. And uh, and I've been uh, for my Sims, I've been the leader of the environmental working group, the very first one. And uh, I, I co-lead with uh, Goodney Axis and the, the deep roots of volcanic geothermal systems. And I work, of course, with some of the emerging technologies work that um, includes uh, a task on induced seismicity and uh, one on uh, corrosion scaling and high temperature traces with, with which Jerry Muller uh, leads. So all of those uh, lead into the um, the work that the collaboration work that we do on uh, deep roots and on um, uh, supercritical systems. And uh, uh, as part of that collaboration work, we put together a, a collaboration paper, which I'll talk about briefly. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work going on in New Zealand in this space, which is the uh, the community engagement uh, aspects that we just heard about um, in, in relation to New Zealand, some of the environmental and social aspects. And I'll talk very briefly about more general environmental issues, uh, which will relate to supercritical and high temperature uh, developments as well, but then focus on some of the more key risk assessments uh, that uh, that I think, and, and I'm just one person, there'll be others that have different opinions, but I think might be uh, key issues to address for uh, high temperature um, developments, eruptions, seismicity and gas, and then perhaps look at key messages for our communities, innovation and collaboration opportunities. Now you will have seen this map before, it's nothing new, but it just illustrates where the Geothermal systems around the world have encountered uh, supercritical system, uh, supercritical temperatures in the past, and uh, and the stars just indicate some of the uh, the countries that are collaborating in this IEA geothermal work, the the deep roots aspect of it, um, and uh, collaboration, coordination, co collaboration. There are all this, the three C's, the very important words between the existing projects. We've learnt today about some of the uh, some of the lessons that have been learnt from this and that we can transfer to, to new projects. Um, we've also learnt about some of the challenges and uh, the solutions for participation. Um, and then maybe through this collaboration, uh, we can look at future uh, innovation opportunities. We've also um, highlighted some of the collaboration that's already existing that's been born out of the uh, of, out of the uh, contacts that have been made through this, um, through these various uh, IPGD and IEA geothermal work. So the supercritical work in New Zealand with its uh, links with the modelling going on in Switzerland, the Japanese supercritical work, and of course uh, what I just mentioned, the Norwegian work with uh, with Jury and uh, and the IDTP projects from Iceland. And uh, we're of course targeting um, uh, we're targeting the, uh, the geothermal conferences for for uh, outcomes from this uh, collaboration work and planning joint workshops, which is what we're right in the middle of right now. But um, before I go any further, I just want to, there's a whole lot of words here, but I just want to highlight what some of the um, goals and uh, tasks are for the uh, geothermal environmental work that we've been doing now for 25 years. And uh, so it's to encourage sustainable development. So sustainable is a very important key word. Um, in other words, we want these systems to be uh, sustained for a long period of time. And so that's in an economic and environmentally responsible manner. So that's a key uh, goal. We want to quantify and balance any adverse and, and beneficial impacts on geothermal energy development. So we're looking there at risks. Um, we are uh, identifying ways of avo avoiding, remedying and mitigating adverse effects. So that's also a key goal. And to, to do that, we've divided, subdivided the environmental work into uh, looking at natural features and groundwaters and monitoring those, looking at uh, rectifying uh, any issues or problems with discharges or reinjection, including gas emissions. So I'll, I'll deal with that a little later. Any chemical contamination of water, any things like subsidence, scaling, corrosion, treatment options, and induced seismicity. So those are, that's a key sector, if you like, of uh, environmental impacts that we, we address. 
Uh, and as part of that, we're looking at uh, methods of impact and mitigation and environmental procedures through analysis of issues, procedures, efficient policies, protocols, effective compliance, all the things that are, that help um, smooth the way, if you like, for for uh, accelerated geothermal development, but uh, need to take into account the um, the the, uh, the community and uh, and also the uh, potential environmental risks. And um, and then finally, sustaining utilization by sort of long term reservoir um, simulations, for example, is, is also very important. Um, now, if we look at the at the paper, the joint paper that we put together for the WTC 2020 plus one, um, we identified in that paper the some of the key challenges and we've heard about those today. Um, solving drilling problems at extremely high temperature and pressure. So. We've heard about some of the common issues that have occurred with the uh, with the projects, particularly in Iceland and uh, and uh, Italy uh, and, and also elsewhere. The problems with casings, the problems with drill strings, with cements and with mud fluids. So those are all um, technical problems that are uh, that we need to solve. And you can you've heard about the how that's how it's happening, how we're getting uh, ongoing research um, breakthroughs in those areas, which are going to assist in the future for making drilling of wells less risky. Um, the next issue there is finding, stimulating and maintaining sufficient permeability to sustain production from a supercritical reservoir. So we've, we've heard about through the modelling sessions and the chemistry sessions how things can change quite quite rapidly, uh, both in terms of uh, stimulating fractures and in, and closing them up again in terms of the chemical uh, issues with uh, silica and other minerals alteration. Those are those are all have an impact on permeability, which will have an impact on production. And uh, so we need to understand those issues much more clearly, I think, for for uh, for the future. Um, and in and, and that item three that's related to that, the competing effects of water rock interaction and thermal stimulation. And then finally, the demonstrating mitigation methods for handling these aggressive fluids. So the vapor, the salts, the magmatic gases and the acid condensates. And this seems to be a sort of a case by case approach. You know, there are some uh, systems where you have very aggressive acidic environments and others where it seems to be less less of an issue. And uh, and we heard about how um, uh, yeah, the, the testing at Krafler demonstrated how some these aggressive fluids can be can be dealt with. Um, but we still need some more in the, in, in the area of corrosion. Um, it's interesting that in the, uh, the, the WSC papers, I, I counted 42 that related to supercritical fluids, but there weren't any actually really addressing any special environmental issues related to future development strategies. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Look at what uh, what are the specific environmental issues that we need to address and and uh, what can we uh, what can we um, anticipate in, for the future? So now I'm moving on to some of the work in New Zealand and uh, here the geothermal, the next generation, another uh, major supporter of this uh, seminar series. But the area that I'm working in um, is uh, called Integrate. It's sort of the third component of the, the three legs of the, of the whole research project, if you like. And it focuses on communicating the research results from the supercritical resources research and addressing environmental and social aspects. And so the key uh, the key issue, challenges related to the key challenges there are quite a number of environmental aspects um, and uh, in New Zealand the uh, the risks the best practice procedures and the mitigation options they will form part of the considerations for consenting authorities before projects can commence so for that reason we need uh, we need to be have a heads up we need early awareness of any significant differences between the conventional and supercritical development strategies. And so that will help the policymakers and the regulators to make informed and timely decisions. Is there anything they have to be aware of that will help in their decision making? Um, and the, we can we can uh, uh, provide that information up front. And so here's a cartoon uh, of, uh, of New Zealand uh, TBZ type of volcanic zone um, development for uh, super super hot systems deep in the uh, under the um, under the top of volcanic zone. And here I've put over the top of it some of the environmental risk factors that we might need to consider. So right at the surface, we've got emissions. How do we deal with those? And uh, in, in that in that space, there is some work going on around the world, but also in New Zealand looking at how to um, how to inject uh, uh, gas emissions from the surf surface discharges, how to re-inject them. And, uh, and there's some success in that area, as we know from the projects in Iceland, um, but but also some small projects going on here. And uh, and it's an ongoing um, research area. Uh, what's the best way to um, uh, inject some of these uh, gases so that we, we they don't end up being in the atmosphere? 
corrosion is a key issue um, at the surface, but also subsurface. And uh, there we're needing to look at protection for groundwaters. We don't want these uh, corrosive fluids to get into groundwaters if we can avoid it. And uh, we're also looking at um, uh, potential risk of spillage from pipelines, et cetera, at the surface. So those are issues that are environmental as well as, uh, uh, as economic and environmental and, and um, uh, sustainability issues. Then uh, we go a bit deeper and we're looking at uh, the issues related to seismicity. We've heard some references to seismicity already um, uh, during the seminar, and uh, I'll deal with that a little bit later in a bit more detail. And then finally, near the bottom, we've got this issue of volcanism. Is volcanism uh, likely to be triggered by development of, of, of super hot temperature systems? And there's various views on that, and uh, we need to um, address those. So, um, so going back to the basics, the environmental issues, what, what are the key issues with the, with communities? And they usually relate to two words, uncertainty and risk. And, uh, and those two words are, are related. Um, so the, 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 the level of uncertainty and the environmental effects often leads to a, a precautionary approach by, by the policymakers, because if they don't know what might go wrong, they often make a decision which stops you from doing it. And um, a protection status locks away these potential energy resources. So uh, my point here is that, and I made this point before at the New Zealand Geothermal Workshop just last week, perceptions can change with acquired knowledge and successful adaptive management practices. So we need to have an open mind about uh, the learnings from our research and from our operation of, of existing systems, how we can improve our uh, management of the systems and therefore how we may be able to develop uh, other systems that are um, have so far been protected, and um, and the key thing to that is injection, sustaining pressures. Now, my key message there is that the policies and regulators that they need to stay adaptive and flexible. So uh, the, we just heard before about the the issue in in Mexico uh, uh, over um, it was not possible for the developer to actually. Um, build a uh, direct use application within their electricity producing field because of policy. Now, um, what I'm saying is that if we can maintain a good communication with the policy makers and the regulators, we may be able to make their, their policy changes um, adaptive and flexible. And uh, the other comment I'd make about uh, this relates to Pat Dobson's talk earlier um, and uh, the uh, issue regarding what is deepen? Deepen when you spell it out as de-risking of exploration of geothermal plays and magmatic environments. So de-risking involves not just making the exploration for these resources uh, more robust and, and more successful, but it's also about looking at the environment and uh, de-risking is part of the aspects of environmental work that uh, we're looking at here. So what are the risks? Well, some of these risks are clearly perceived and some of them are real. And uh, we need to separate these. And in, in the communication of risks, we need to be very careful of the, of the words that we use. Um, so in the exploration and development of deep roots, uh, the, the three areas that I've identified, and there will be more, but the three areas that I've identified as the key risks would be the handling of the aggressive fluids. So the steam, the salt, the magnetic gases, the acid condensates, et cetera but also the coping with local seismicity and volcanism. So in some areas that's a big issue, in other areas it's not. And uh, sometimes it's induced and sometimes it's natural. So we need to be able to separate those. And finally, finding a sustaining permeability for a long-term operation. Nobody wants a plant that's going to be installed and, and, and operating for five years and then has to shut down and, uh, and, and all the sort of environmental consequences of that. So we want to be able to demonstrate through modeling and, and through uh, you know, robust kind of um, staging of projects that the, uh, the, long, the operation can be sustained long term. So those are the key issues there. And uh, uh, in, the, in a New Zealand example, um, I gave this example also uh, at the New Zealand workshop last week, and I was asking people to think, where would you actually site a four to six kilometer deep well in this active zone? And this is, uh, clearly very high temperature underneath nearly all of the top of volcanic zone. Um, where would you site one? And if you did, uh, given your preferred site, what special environmental considerations do you think are important to address? And this is a little bit subjective. There will be people who will say, oh, I'm looking after the hot spring in my backyard is very important. Others will say, I don't want to feel an earthquake, thank you very much. And others will say, well, if you do it, how long is it going to last? And there will be community and cultural issues. There will be uh, risks from from blowouts. There'll be production risks from emissions, 
corrosion risks, etc. So all of those issues I've listed there could would have a different ranking for different people. Um, and, uh, and we need a, a, a community engagement to be able to find out in a particular place what those issues, what is the ranking of those issues for that community? Uh, and these uh, these issues are often are usually addressed by the resource development consenting process in New Zealand. So um, people can come along with their issues and, and actually address them during, have them addressed during the hearing process. Um, oops, I have to go back, sorry. Yeah. Yep, I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, I just lost the presentation, but I'll get it back. Um, there we go, it's back again. So oh, where are we now? Well, we're at a, a, a checklist tables. I, I put these together many years ago for the uh, work with uh, with the IEA Geothermal, and uh, it just identifies perhaps in some kind of chronological order what you need to look at for um, for uh, environmental issues. And, and of course, at the top, the access, the allocation, the consents, the permits, and the social license. So I've, I've talked a little bit about those just in the previous slide, and. Uh, the environmental issues for drilling and construction activities, they, I've listed these here. So for drilling and construction, there's a whole list of things and, and ways you can avoid them and remediate them and, and mitigate for them. Um, just one example, noise, for example, from a drilling uh, operation, you can install mufflers on your motors and you put up noise screens. So those are the sort of things you'd address during a drilling and exploration uh, um, stage of the of the project. And then when you get into the ongoing geothermal operations, these are some of the issues that you need to look at potentially. There'll be others depending on the, the where you are in the world. But um, just to, as an example, limit magnitude, uh, large magnitude induced size, seismicity, um, etc. So those are the sort of things that we address in a conventional system. Now, um, uh, I'm going to address now some of the more key issues that have been uh, raised with respect to uh, supercritical or high temperature systems. And uh, one of them is induced seismicity. And uh, I noted in the World Geothermal Congress that as many as 35 papers on this topic, um, and uh, but not many addressing, uh, not so many addressing the, uh, the, the risks. But uh, what I did notice is that in, in the papers that coming from Europe and Korea in particular, and geosismicity has actually been a showstopper for some EGS projects. Whereas in, in conventional hydrothermal projects, and uh, New Zealand is uh, the example of that, uh, it's been mostly tolerated. And uh, I've put here a table that I prepared some years ago uh, at the bottom of uh, a number of projects around the world where we've got quite large, a long history of operation and quite large installed capacities um, and, and large numbers of earthquakes, uh, micro earthquakes per, per month being been uh, noted and uh, been recorded. So you know, as many as 400 micro earthquakes recorded per month um, and some locations none. So there's a big variation in, in uh, geothermal projects, uh, conventional geothermal projects. The maximum magnitudes goes up to 4.1 and, and ranges between about two and four. The, the maximum depth ranges between about three and seven kilometers. So relatively shallow in the, in the shallow parts of the crust. And of course, when we're getting into the ductile conditions under these conventional systems, you don't see uh, seismicity. Um, they're all associated with quite large mass loss and large flows, uh, megatons net mass loss and quite large pressure changes. But the key thing about explaining the induced seismicity in these areas is uh, in these conventional systems is that it's a combination of uh, the mechanisms are a combination of uh, pressure change due to uh, due to uh, injection and production, pressure transients and uh, temperature change, giving you thermal stresses and of course the, the propagation of those stresses into areas which are critically stressed. So uh, that's that's in, in a nutshell. We've heard more about that from other speakers, but that in a nutshell is where the uh, seismicity comes from. And uh, how do we differentiate between induced and natural? That's still an open question and it's still quite, quite difficult. Uh, we did see a, a paper earlier in the session, uh, oh, sorry, a paper from Nature which from 2019, which discussed the risks of reinjection, seismicity enhanced geothermal systems. 
and super critical, enhanced supercritical geothermal systems from a European perspective. And basically that paper was saying, be very careful, uh, particularly if those uh, events get to a level where the, the community at the surface, uh, the community on the surface uh, are adversely affected. And, uh, and Sam Scott in a, in a presentation um, on Monday said basically the same thing. Avoid the induced seismicity in, in the European setting because it it uh, it is not welcome. Whereas in, in most of these conventional systems, which we're talking we're talking about very high temperature, deep roots, um, it's kind of accepted. So I want to give a couple of examples from New Zealand as why that might be the case. And it's all about community engagement. So in New Zealand, uh, we have a, 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 a web web based organization GeoNet, which gives them almost immediate um, information about any uh, earthquakes that are, are felt above about magnitude two. And so you can look them up online quickly. And uh, and they also produce bulletins and media reports. And here's a couple of examples of relatively large events that were uh, from within the Rotokawa field and within the Kaurau geothermal field. This one was a magnitude 3.8, five kilometers depth. So a decent size shock, uh, only 10 kilometers from away from where we live here in Taupo. And uh, the, the quote from that media report was, earthquake activity is very common about the Rotokawa geothermal field. We've located over 70 earthquakes there in the last year. So a kind of reassuring thing, it's not unusual um, and it hasn't caused any damage. So yeah, what's the problem? <laughs> That's almost the approach from the, from the uh, uh, media report. And then another one back in 2018 where the magnitude was 4.1. There was a whole swarm of earthquakes. Here's a, a, a one 24 hour plot of uh, what that, uh, sequence of earthquakes looked like and it tripped all the local geothermal turbines so it was big enough for, for the tremors to actually trip the turbines there was a rumbling noise noted by the community but that wasn't from the earthquake it was from steam venting because of the tripping of the turbines and uh, the comment from the from the uh, media uh, release was that the safety systems all worked as expected and although unsettling were perfectly normal so this this is the approach that uh, community has accepted um, and the reason why I think the uh, New Zealand community has accepted relatively large earthquakes, magnitude four, that are not damaging, but uh, uh, concerning, the unsettling, shall we say. And, uh, and then the, the next issue is, uh, does geothermal production or injection actually induce earthquakes? And of course, we, we say yes, they that it does. But in, in this particular case in Wairaki, we have a long history of pressure changes going back 60 years. And we have, this is pressure drawdown, and then uh, in more recent years, since around 2000, pressure increase and then drawdown again. And then you look at the uh, the seismicity based on the, uh, the, the GeoNet network, not the local network, but the GeoNet network. And uh, you can see there's, there seems to be a bit of a cluster in later years, around 2000. But in fact, when you look at uh, the magnitudes, uh, the, um, the earlier data was not as well um, recorded because they didn't have such a good network. So the lower magnitude events weren't all uh, collected ca or captured. So when you look at the larger events above, say, magnitude three, there isn't really any trend. There are the, it's been uh, steady for, for 50, 60 years, 50 years at least, in terms of the larger magnitude events within the within and near the uh, Wairiki field. And when you look at the, the uh, plots based on the local network of seismicity, you can see that uh, around the, the Wairiki geothermal field, a lot of the uh, the, the located events are induced and they are clustered around production sectors and around injection sectors. And when you look at a cross section showing the depths, there's a lot of them that are within the bore field and within the depth range of the bores, but there are also some underlying ones and some of the larger ones are occurring down at five, six kilometers depth. So what does this all mean? Well, um, there are some probably natural events due to the local stress changes, but there, also, there is also induced seismicity um, but it hasn't to date caused any concern with the local community. It does show permeability structure and changes, and it has proven to be very useful for the reservoir modelers to, um, to simulate uh, potential changes in permeability. Uh, it does show stress and fault anisotropy, moment enters, brittle ductile transition depths and things like that. Um, here's another example from New Zealand, uh, from Rotokawa, where uh, quite an interesting example of injection induced seismicity where there's fluid flowing down into this deep part of the reservoir and back up again. And here's the cluster of seismicity around the injection wells out to the southeast and the production wells to the northwest. Um, and and all, this, all this work is, is well published. Um, I will just stress that it's important when you're looking at the, the depths of these events and you're saying there's 337 degrees at the bottom of that well, there must be supercritical conditions down here. Where's the ductile 
is, is it down at five, six kilometres depth? Um, and uh, where's the brittle failure going on? And uh, these depths, I will point out, they are dependent on the velocity model. So there's some work to do on making sure that your velocity models are accurate enough to get the depths accurately. And uh, finally, uh, uh, well, in this list of three issues is uh, eruptions. And uh, there are three different types of eruptions. There's the hydrothermal eruptions, which are of shallow origin and and not so dangerous, but we've had a few around here, around Taupo, and if you're close enough, they, they can be uh, they can be a high risk. Um, they're due to boiling fluids close to the surface, and if you have some high temperature fluids coming up to the surface, obviously you can expect some of these. There's phreatic eruptions, which is a, you know, a transient pulse of high temperature gas. This is um, from Tongariro, and, and it's a part of a national park. It's a protected geothermal system with an active volcano underneath it, and uh, the argument is that this is not involving any new magma, it's just a hydrothermal or phreatic eruption resulting from high temperature gas leaking into a geothermal system. But pretty dramatic and large boulders out of this eruption actually came down through a hut pretty close to where this photo was taken actually, uh, went through the roof and landed in a bed. Unfortunately, there was no body on the bed at the time, but these boulders are pretty big and quite damaging. And this of course is an active volcano. So um, yeah, there, there are variations in risk. I think uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what happens to magma in a well bore, and there was an interesting paper from David Dempsey in the New Zealand Geothermal Workshop that I could refer you to, where he, he and his students have modelled magma rising up a well bore and points out that it's unlikely to actually reach the surface for various reasons. Uh, you need a bore something like 30 metres in diameter, which is actually a volcano, in order to get the magma to come to the surface. Um, CO2 emissions, uh, yeah, I, was, I wanted to point this out. CO2 emissions are clearly an issue with any kind of geothermal development. It's becoming more of an issue and uh, an, an injection of uh, CO2 is clearly uh, going to help with that. But um, gas reinjection and sequestration trials are ongoing. But I just wanted to show this plot, which shows that in New Zealand generation, the green plot has, has risen quite steeply over the years. This is from 1975 to present day. And, um, and the, of course, accordingly, the uh, total uh, CO2 emissions have gone up as well. But what is crucial is this, this red graph, graph, which is emissions factor. So it's the kilograms per megawatt hour uh, from the fields. And over the whole of New Zealand geothermal fields, the average has been going down. So it's halved over time. And that is a consequence of degassing of the uh, system that's being, um, uh, um, that's being extracted, energy has been extracted from, reinjection into that with uh, degassed fluids. So although we're emitting gases, we are actually degassing the reservoir. And uh, the argument is that if you model this over gas emission over a full lifespan, so looking at 100 years of production and 300 years of recovery for this one, one field in New Zealand, which is relatively high gas at Ohaki, O'Sullivan and Al et al. Uh, were able to demonstrate that there's net zero gas emission. So the uh, the gas that you uh, that is accelerated out of the system in the first 100 years actually leads to a depletion in gas emission in the following years. And uh, so over the full lifespan of a geothermal operation, which includes the recovery period, there is net zero. So a very interesting study. Uh, I suggest you have a look at it if you're interested in gas emissions. Um, finally, uh, we're looking at sustainable uh, um, uh, optimum management strategy for operation of super critical resources. And see here, I've got this acronym SMASH. Sustain the resources for a long term, manage the resources flexibly, adapt reinjection to control subsurface pressures, stage development increments to reduce risk, and help balance these adverse and beneficial effects by enhancing features and protecting the ground and surface waters and reinjecting your gases. So I'm, I'm coming to the conclusions now. Maybe I've gone too, through this too quickly, but this is uh, what I just want to emphasize. What is our vision for, the, for a supercritical geothermal future? Well, we can access routes safely. Um, and we're learning about that from uh, experience from all around the world and uh, shared experiences, deep ultra hot temperature and pressure and fat stimulation. We're looking at emissions and uh, how to treat them, inject them or sequester them so that we're not contributing to the global warming issue. We're looking at uh, making these projects more economic and that might be through hybrid projects or byproducts, uh, hydrogen, etc., transport. And we're looking at improving our models. So model refinements and that provides better predictions for planning into the future. Um, but as I said right at the beginning, there's still some critical issues to address, and they include these drilling problems at high temperature and pressure, the material selection to deal with corrosion of gassy fluids, and uh, stimulating reservoir and geochemical processes and finding, creating, sustaining permeability in these brittle ductile transition conditions. So those are the issues that still need to be researched and, and the results shared. 
And I, I always like to finish with some positive takeaway messages. So this is the sort of thing I like to say, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you just say over to yourself, well, super critical. Geothermal fluid extraction, it can be sustainable. It can be environmentally benign. Reinjection to these reservoirs, it can be safe and it can be effective. Fracturing to stimulate fluid flow, it can be effective, particularly in this brittle ductile transition. And adaptive field management, it will achieve sustainable development through collaboration and community supported decision making. So those are the positive takeaway messages. So that's it for me. Thanks very much. Um, as I said, I've been involved in all of these, uh, all of these uh, organizations, the IAA Geothermal for 25 years, the uh, IPGT for, for its entire history. And, uh, and of course, in, in the last two or three years with the Geothermal, the next generation and Geo New Zealand research as an integrated member. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Chris. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just looking at the chat. There is um, one rather long uh, question for you, so that's probably better than me reading it out for you. Uh, there yep, might be a second sure. one. There might be a second one there now. So if you can answer that, that'd be really good. Of course, yes. Um, yeah, the, the question is the modelling work yesterday showed clearly how the geothermal systems are interconnected with not from root to surface. Is there any work being done to anticipate the effects in the surface features to prepare the regulators to deal with the uncertainties and the effects to surface features and the precautionary response that may be required? Um, or with most, uh, uh, in fact, it will cause delays or barriers for conceding. Um, yeah, a, a, a good question, good long question. Um, is there any work being done to anticipate the effects? Uh, I think um, what we can do is we can look at uh, our history of, uh, uh, of development management. Uh, so pressure management in the shallower um, uh, aquifers has been successful at um, uh, 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 managing the effects on the surface. And I think the, the, the message is the deeper you go, the, the more, um, the, the less direct connection there is from depth to surface. But clearly, uh, I think I gave you that example from Tong Tongariro from Timari crater eruption that uh, when you get a, a high, very high temperature gas injection into a geothermal system, that can boil things and cause some very rapid uh, uh, phreatic eruptions. So uh, that, that's an important thing to, to look at to see whether is that a natural event or could that be stimulated by a, um, by a supercritical system and so supercritical development. So we need to look at modelling those sort of things. And uh, the difficulty, as we, we've noted before, is that not modelling transients in, in, a, in a steady state is, is extremely difficult. You need the, the kind of software that can go down to sort of seconds time frames when, while it's modelling over thousands and thousands of years. And that's uh, quite challenging. And uh, the second question, uh, need to look at perforation effectiveness in stimulated wells. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I guess we need to do that as well. So, uh, oh, one more. Okay. <laughs> a question similar to the previous one. Is there uncertainty in estimating temperature at larger depths before drilling, um, or is it correctly estimating the permeability of the main, the, the permeability of the main uncertainty? Um, uh, yeah, I guess estimating the permeability is always an uncertainty. The the techniques that we have, the geophysical techniques that we have, uh, are not particularly good at, at uh, identifying permeability. Otherwise, we would have all our exploration wells would be 100% successful. Um, and uh, at temperatures, it's a little easier to to uh, extrapolate from uh, from geophysical information, but the permeability is the is the real tricky one. 